In this supplemental video to my part two of introduction to set theory, I'd like to speak a bit about the universal set, which is a set which would supposedly contain everything in the set theoretic universe. And I'd like to give you two arguments against the existence of such a set in ZFC. Now for aesthetic reasons, one might want to talk about a set which contains everything that one could possibly speak about, or a set which would contain all the sets in the set theoretic universe. So in a slapdash point of view, we might just claim that this set exists. And uh, formally, we might say that such a universal set, which I'll denote by V, is a set containing all sets. That is to say, if you can find me a set X, then X is going to belong to the set V. And all the members of the set V are going to be sets. And furthermore, if V is a set, then it must follow that V is contained within itself. Now already this is quite problematic if you think of our usual idea of what a set is. It's, it's, it's a collection of objects. Now, normally, the object isn't contained within itself. So already speaking of a set V being contained within itself is quite problematic. And to set up my first argument against the existence of this universal set V, I'd like to remind you of the subset axiom that we covered in part two, which said that if some object A is a set, then B is also a set where B is defined as follows. B is going to be all the objects X, such that X is a member of A, which is assumed to be a set, and some proposition involving X. And this proposition is left in a vague sense. It could be pretty much anything. You just plop in some proposition here, and the set B would exist. And hopefully you notice that B is going to be a subset, just to remind you, because it's containing all, it's selecting objects which are already in A and are subject to some further restrictions. So B is going to be some subset of A. Now it may be the case that no objects in A uh, fall under this restriction, in which case B would be the empty set, which is perfectly fine because the empty set is a subset of any set. Just to give you an example of what some proposition involving X might look like, we could plop in X is a member of C, where C is some other set, in which case B would be a subset of A still. And more specifically, B would be A intersect C. And like I said before, we could pro uh, plop in some proposition which is never instantiated, in which case B, if I substitute X is not equal to X, B would just be the empty set, because there's, there's no way that you're going to get an object which is not equal to itself. Here's my first argument against such a set V. And furthermore, this is actually a theorem in ZFC, uh, that there is no set V containing all sets. But as I say, this proposition is provable within ZFC. And the proof goes as follows. We're going to prove this by contradiction. Uh, that is, we're going to suppose that there is such a set V which contains all sets. What we're going to do is find another set, which I'll call A, which cannot possibly be within the set V. And notice that if I can do this, if I can construct another set A, which is not a member of V, then that contradicts the definition of V containing all sets. So by the subset axiom, if V exists, then the following set A also exists. So A is going to be defined as all the objects X, such that X is in the set V, and X is not a member of itself, X. And as I said before, it, the quality of this uh, proposition doesn't really matter. I can just plop in whatever I want. In this case, I'm going to plop in the proposition X is not a member of X. And let's work with that. Now, it must be the case that either A is a member of A or A is not a member of A. And actually, I should have put the word X or there, exclusive or, meaning that exactly one of the true uh, of these two propositions must be true. And they can't both be true and they can't both be false simultaneously. So we're going to go through each case. First, let's suppose that it's true that A is a member of A. Now, if A is a member of A, it must have met both of these entry conditions. So that means that A is a member of V, which is okay so far because we're supposing that V is containing all sets. And it must also be the case 
that A is not a member of A. Now, as I said before, it can't be true simultaneously that A is a member of A and A is not a member of A. So we get a contradiction here. So right off the bat, we know that A cannot be a member of A. So that's our first conclusion, that A is not a member of A. Now, if A is not a member of A, that means it must have failed to meet at least one of these two entry conditions. So if A is not a member of A, that implies that either A is not a member of V or A is a member of A. Now, at least one of these two propositions must be true. They can both be true, but we notice that this proposition here, A being a member of A, contradicts what we already know, which is A is not an A. Therefore, our second, conclu our second conclusion is that A is not a member of V. So we have two conclusions, that A is not a member of A, and A is not a member of V. And as I said before, we found some set A, which is not a member of this supposed set of all sets. So we've just shown that V is not a universal set. Now I'd like to present yet another argument against this uh, set of all sets. And to do that, I'd like to remind you of the power set axiom, which says that if A is a set, then the power set of A is also a set. And remember what the power set is, it's just listing out all of the subsets of A. And uh, further notice that normally when you take a power set, actually in all cases when you take a power set, the number of objects increases. That is to say, if A has n members, then the power set of A has 2 to the n members. And for uh, infinite sets, this is also true in a sense, except both still contain an infinite number of objects, but the cardinality still varies between the two. So again, let V be the universal set. So let's suppose this set V, the set of all sets, is a set that is, it exists. Then it must follow that the power set of V is also a set. So we have this set V. It contains some number of objects. I take the power set, and what do you think happens to the number of members in this set? Now, V is already containing all sets that we could possibly speak of, so it's quite large. And power set of V is 2 to that, informally speaking, it's 2 to that number of members. And we have to somehow claim that the power set of V is also a set. And uh, to give the precise argument against why this, um, this observation rules out the existence of V, since V contains everything, the power set of V must merely be picking out some of those things within V. Because remember, V contains everything, so the power set of V is just kind of picking out some of those things. So it must be the case that the power set of V is a subset of V. And by Cantor's theorem, which uh, if you don't know this already, you'll learn this in part 17, the power set of any set has a strictly greater cardinality which, if you haven't heard that word, the cardinality is, is, informally speaking, the number of members in a set. The power set of V is going to have a strictly greater cardinality than V, which is, say, as I was saying before, the power set, the operation taking the power set tends to increase the number of members of a set. So imagine the set containing everything already. I take the power set, it's got to increase the number of members. But we just said that somehow the power set of V is a subset of V. So, so how does that work out? So this is really the, the second argument against the existence of such a set that contains everything. So that'll wrap up this video. Hopefully you've enjoyed this discussion about the supposed universal set. And hopefully I'll get some of you guys interested in uh, going over some of the more controversial and problematic areas that have appeared in the history of mathematics. Thanks for watching.